So we've just come from PMQs and there was a lot of NHS chat during that. Obviously the ambulance workers are on strike today. Were you surprised to learn that Rishi Sunak uses private healthcare? I'm not at all surprised to hear that Rishi Sunak uses private health care. I was more surprised he's registered with an NHS GP, although it does raise the question, does he ever use it? Um, and in his own backyard in Richmond, in his constituency, the number of GPs have in fact decreased and that's on his watch. So whilst he may well have access to, I think it's £250 for a half an hour uh, GP here in Westminster, his own constituents are struggling to see a GP and he seems to have absolutely no answer for how he's going to increase the number of GPs in the system, how he's going to sort out the issues in the NHS. He's totally floundering on this issue and his own personal choices, frankly, are neither here nor there. I'd forgive him seeing a private GP if he sorted GPs out for everyone else. Well, the one thing he did give us an answer to was the ambulance strikes today and that was with the anti-strike legislation that, that the Tories put down yesterday. Do you think that there's any chance that that's going to work or do you think that's the right way to approach strikes? I am just dismayed at the way this government is tackling the strikes issue. The fact is ambulance drivers, NHS nurses, they're not just striking over pay. Yes, pay is, pay is the least of the issues and they deserve more pay in my view. What they're also striking about is that there isn't already a minimum service level. They already don't have enough ambulance drivers and nurses and doctors and all of these strikes all they're going to do is encourage people out of the profession and if they were serious about sorting this out they would get round a table they would treat nhs workers with the respect they so richly deserve instead of legislating through parliament there's so much we need to be getting done and they are distracting with this legislation. Stop distracting, stop posturing, get around a table and treat them with some respect. I think that would go a long way. What have your constituents had to say about the recent NHS strikes? You know what, they're really supportive of the NHS strikes and they understand why they are doing it. Many of the NHS workers are constituents too and they tell me that it's the very last thing they want to have to do. They are at their wits end but they also point out that the government has been totally duplicitous about the causes of this. They're blaming Covid, they're blaming other factors. It was bad before Covid. Covid made it worse, absolutely, but it was bad before Covid and what we have seen is years and years of underinvestment, years and years of them not listening to the profession and now they have the audacity to even blame the workers themselves. They've taken the completely wrong approach and my view is that actually they're just out of ideas, aren't they? They don't know what they're doing, they don't know how to fix this. They're just throwing spaghetti at a wall, hoping to put, distract politically. But the only thing that's actually going to fix the NHS is to get the Tories out. So you wouldn't say cut the Tories some slack for delays caused by Covid? Covid? is awful, has been awful, it's affected so many people. We're here at the wall where so many people have died. But Tory mismanagement is also causing deaths. We've discovered tens of thousands of excess deaths this year as a result of Tory mismanagement, not just COVID. So I think they need to be held accountable for the deaths that they have presided over that were unnecessary. And if they invested properly in the NHS, if they had a proper workforce plan, if they recruited properly and if they treated those workers with respect, all of those things would have been made much, much easier. Covid is not the only thing. It was an important thing, but for them to try and blame it all on Covid just shows they don't have a grip on the situation in the first place. It's also fitting that we're here because about an hour and a half ago, one Tory backbencher, Andrew Bridgen, lost the whip for claiming that the vaccine was similar somehow to the Holocaust. What are your thoughts on that? I mean, A, it's Andrew Bridgen, who I think has finally not, I'm glad he's lost the whip, but he's clearly lost the plot. I mean, it, it, he, he shouldn't be an MP full stop, let alone a Tory MP. Because look where we are. These are people who've lost their lives. That vaccine saved lives. I'm an Oxford MP. I am so proud that it was Oxford scientists who helped to develop the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. And the way that that technology is now going to move forward and help other diseases across the world. These conspiracy theorists have happened because of, actually, I think poor management and poor communication by the government during COVID. And I think the government has some blame here too. But for Andrew Bridgen to go out there and permeate and in encourage these conspiracy theorists, I think is a really, really dangerous place to be. And I'm glad that he's lost the whip. I think he should lose his seat. I think they should call a by-election. He just needs to get out of there. 
Parliament is also overrun outside Westminster in general with anti-vax campaigners. I mean, do you think there is a place in Parliament or in the Commons to debate the efficacy of the vaccine? So I chair the all-party parliamentary group on coronavirus and we were really concerned throughout the pandemic that if you had a situation where the government looked like it was imposing things on people, that that would actually cause them to entrench more and not trust the government. And so we were worried about this. We were worried about the effect that lockdowns would have. We were worried about the effect of vaccine passports. And the way that you get anti-vaxxers and people who are sceptical of the vaccine to take it is by having one-to-one -one in-depth conversations about what their fears may be, why they've come to that conclusion and to bring them along. But there also comes a point where it becomes dangerous. And there are people in positions of influence and power who should actually just know better. And if they have been caught up in this, I think it is really, really dangerous. The vaccines are safe. They are trialed. They've been tested. There is no conspiracy here. They are just there to save lives. And the science that has come from it is incredible. So to all those people still wondering if they should get their booster, for the sake of the NHS, for the sake of the pressures we're seeing now, please go get it. Also go get your flu jab. And please just don't listen to people like Andrew Bridgen. I want to change the topic. There is suggestion that a removal centre for refugees could be set up in your constituency. This could house about 400 people. How do you feel about that? Oh, I am, I'm just dismayed that they are looking at reopening Camps Field House. We fought actually for 30 years. Um, the MP for me, Evan Harris, fought for this as well. And I, as the MP for those detainees, when they were still there before it closed in 2018, I took up their cases, I heard their stories. Most of them were asylum seekers from places like Satsuzan and Eritrea and parts of the world where they desperately just need help. Many of them were tortured. I even discovered that there was a child that had been there. They were 14 years old. I mean, the people who were there deserve our compassion and our love and our help. The issue is that the asylum system is broken and it's the Tories that have broken it. That £400 million pounds or whatever it is that they're spending on reopening Campsfield and another one in Gosport would be better spent on increasing the number of um, people in the Home Office who can process those applications. No one is saying that anyone who's a criminal should come here and stay here and be looked after. No one is saying that. But the way that we sort the wheat from the chaff, the people who genuinely have asylum claims and those criminals, is to process their applications quicker, not to spend that money on what is essentially a glorified prison. And I just think it's atrocious. I think it again shows a government that has admitted its failure because it can't sort out the applications process issue so it's decided to put them all in an asylum uh, a, a detention center instead so rwanda plan is part of the culture war rwanda plan again it's we can't solve the problem here so we're going to ship them off you know out of sight out of mind actually the vast majority of people who come over and this is the home office's own data shows that they are genuine asylum seekers and yes they want to make it look like we're being you know, invaded, was I think the words that Suella Braverman said. Those people on those boats, some of those are from Afghanistan. They're the same people who we said that we would evacuate. We owe them an apology. <laughs> we don't owe them you know, this horrid, inhumane plan to ship them off to Rwanda. Well, however lovely Rwanda may be you know, at the moment, that's, that's nothing against Rwanda, but we have our own... Um, we have our own policies here, and I think they've approached it the wrong way. I understand that people find it distressing. I understand that the government wants to do something. I just think that they've totally, totally approached it in the wrong way. And if I was them, I would focus on the real issues here. Climate change, making sure that we restore overseas development aid. Those are the things that are going to keep people in their countries. They don't want to leave, but they feel they have to leave. What are we doing there? They're cutting that funding. They're just making the problems worse.